out, uh, we're going to move on to our fourth speaker, Zina Reich. Zina is part of Enda Gelande. The Alliance organizes mass actions of civil disobedience against fossil infrastructure in Germany. While focusing on blocking and coal at first, the group has shifted their focus to gas in 2020. The general goal has stayed the same, though, to challenge the colonial fossil capitalist status quo and strive for global climate justice. So please welcome Zina. Thank you. I am very honored to speak here today as a voice from the climate justice movement in Europe, or to be more specific, in Germany. I was invited to talk about the climate struggles here, about current strategies and trends in the climate movement, but I will also very briefly talk about the false solutions that the neoliberals and the capitalist states offer about green capitalism and green colonialism. So let's have a look at the climate justice movement and at the climate movement in general. As you can see, I'm already making a differentiation here. So uh, what is climate justice? This will be nothing new to some of you, but I think it's good to repeat it every now and then. The concept of climate justice focuses on the discrepancy between who is historically responsible for climate change, for the climate crisis, versus who suffers the consequences most heavily. We just heard from Azra, Pakistan is one example. It's Western countries, the global north, which historically caused most greenhouse gas emissions. And the ones suffering the consequences most heavily are mostly countries of the global south. There is the ruling class accumulating wealth, now building bunkers to hide out and prepping for extreme weather events or if society collapses, as they say. And here is us, without bunkers, but building communities to rely on. We understand that climate change is not just a physical problem, a problem of natural science, but a matter of social justice, a matter of class, and a matter of global north versus global south. All coastal areas will be affected by rising sea levels, but to give a very simple example, we can compare the Netherlands to Bangladesh. The Netherlands have enough capital to build higher dams or even swimming cities, while Bangladesh doesn't have the same means to protect itself. Climate justice as we understand it is a concept that goes with a critique of colonialism and capitalism. It looks at power structures and at capital accumulation. Climate justice also centers frontline communities as leaders of the global struggle. That's communities directly affected by fossil fuel projects. Indigenous communities play a particularly vital role. Firstly, for obvious anti-colonial reasons, these communities have been dehumanized and erased for centuries and these attacks simply must stop. And secondly, because 80% of global biodiversity lives on lands that belong to indigenous people, even though they are less than 5% of the world's human population. Again, 80% of all species on this planet live on indigenous lands. Supporting the struggle of indigenous communities and protecting indigenous land rights therefore means protecting biodiversity. So the global climate justice movement is led by indigenous communities and they are one center in our analysis. They have been fighting the longest and the hardest and we as people who grew up in Germany in a center of capitalist modernity we have a lot to learn from them and from anti-colonial struggles in general. So that was a basic introduction to climate justice. Having that said, let's get back to look at what the climate justice movement in Germany has been doing, and more broadly, what the climate movement here has been doing. Only 15 years ago, the climate movement here was incredibly small especially regarding groups with an anti-capitalist analysis, it was probably a handful. In 2010, the first climate camp took place near, near the Rhine, uh, in the Rhineland near Cologne. 
In 2011, the first camp in Lusatia in Eastern Germany followed. To 2012, the Hambacher Forest was occupied, an ancient forest in the Rhineland that was getting more and more destroyed for coal mining. 2015, the movement organized its first mass action of civil disobedience against a lignite mine, that's these big open cast mines for brown coal, applying methods developed in the anti-nuclear movement. So in the anti-nuclear movement, people had put on white suits in their actions to block caster trains transporting nuclear waste. And they developed specific blocking techniques, like how to get through police lines, how to organize and how to guide hundreds of people, and how to have democratic decisions in the action in very dynamic situations. These were the same methods we used later to block uh, these massive coal pits with thousands of people. This alliance named itself Ende Gelände, and the aim, our aim was to build up the movement, get more people involved, to put climate on the agenda, and to pinpoint the cause of the problem, capitalism. Surprise. Years of movement building followed with mass actions and forest occupations. We connected with frontline struggles around the world, and we did community organizing in the villages around the coal pits. Coal companies have been tearing down villages, forests, and agricultural lands for decades, and the, yeah, uh, for decades, relocating 10,000s of people. These people are the ones we cooperated with locally, and we connected them with people from the global south who were fighting against coal mining in their regions. And this is really quite the success story. Most of these people in the German villages, they weren't social justice warriors or socialists or anarchists. They were regular people, angry about getting their house taken away, about losing their farm, and the soil there is one of the best soils in Europe. They were angry about their own situation. But when they spoke, from people from, when they spoke to people from Bangladesh, from Colombia or from the Pacific Islands, they realized, hold on, people all over the world are losing their homes for this economy, for this economy built on fossil fuels. So suddenly, the not very political farmer is talking about the climate crisis, about colonialism, about capitalism. I like to tell this story particularly because many leftists here are very subcultural. They see themselves as separate from society and just look for the mistakes that the normal people make. So as soon as someone uses the wrong word or uh, says something sexist, which is annoying, of course, <laughs> most leftists don't want to work with them anymore. But that's a strategy to stay marginal, not a strategy to actually build up power and change something. So we build these relationships and after some time, we can also have the conversation about these sexist jokes and people actually listen and consider what we're saying and change. So we had great experiences with this community organizing in the coal mining areas. The movement was getting bigger from year to year and then suddenly everything happened really fast. October 2018, the Hambacher Forest became a crystallization point of ecological resistance with thousands of people protesting and putting their bodies in the way to prevent further destruction. Coincidentally, just a few weeks later, Greta Thunberg received worldwide attention and inspired students all over the world to start Fridays for Future groups. So 2019, as you know, became the big year of the climate movement with many young people getting involved who weren't politicized before in Germany, but also around the world. The COVID pandemic has made everything more difficult for some time. I don't wanna bore you with this topic, we all know. 
but we continued doing some work. We as Ende Gelände switched focus from coal to gas, fossil gas, and other comrades built up Lützerath as a crystallization point. It's a village next to a coal mine that was destroyed now. Generally speaking, since 2019, the climate movement became incredibly diverse and many new organizations popped up. I thought a lot about how to summarize what's been happening and I came up with five trends in the climate movement in the past couple of years. Now I have to say sorry to the translators because in their version it's four trends, but now it's five. <laughs> <laughs> so the three, is, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is based on my experience, my general impressions. It's not carved in stone. As you see, I got another thing. Oh, and um, I'm happy to discuss them later on as well. Maybe we find six and seven and eight, I don't know. Okay, so the first trend. Newer groups emerge with people who didn't have any experience or anti-capitalist analysis before, but they get into the struggle with a lot of desperation, which is understandable because we are so close to crossing red lines of the climate, to go past 1.5 degrees, to go past tipping points, and to trigger self-reinforcing self cycles, meaning that the climate will heat itself up even, even without any more human activity. So the desperation is very understandable. But of course, when you are led mostly by the desperation and lack an understanding of the climate crisis being connected to capitalism, this is quite dangerous. If you don't see the cause of the problem right, you won't fight for the necessary solutions. So sometimes the demands of these groups can be, very, can be rather reformist. The second trend is that mass actions of civil disobedience, such as Ende Gelände, change. These actions want to block fossil infrastructure, and most of them used to be occupying fossil infrastructure without destroying anything. Now we see a trend to sabotage, which means breaking the machines there. People think we haven't done enough yet, we have to go one step further and sabotage fossil fuel companies to keep them from destroying the world further. The third trend is a decolonization of the movement itself. So climate activists of color have criticized the whiteness of the climate movement and gave very necessary critiques. This, I wouldn't say this is a new trend, this has been, this is always part of the struggle and it's still not over, so it's an ongoing reflection on anti-racism within the movement that's very necessary. The fourth trend. Many climate activists are going into organizing workers or supporting unions especially in sectors that are relevant for an ecological transition, public transport, for example. The last big global strike of Fridays for Future was connected to a strike of the union Verdi, focusing on workers in public transport. This is great news, but it also showed the typical problems when you work with the big unions in Germany. They are not political unions, they are Einheitsgewerkschaften, unity unions, so workers from different political spectrums get together to work only for their common interests in the job, getting higher wages, shorter working hours, etc. But political strike, yeah, but political strike for larger goals, <laughs> this is illegal in Germany. It's a bit complicated legally, but political strikes are generally considered to be illegal. Very absurd. So a general strike because people are unhappy with the climate policies of this government, that's considered illegal. So even now, when Verdi went on strike for higher wages and combined that with Fridays for Future strikes, 
it was a big scandal and some people said this is illegal, this is too political. Of course it was mainly the business people and industry bosses, but still the legal situation here is difficult. To put it simply, unions are only allowed to strike for wages and other stuff directly connected to the job, not for political things like the climate. As you can see, it's really a bit of a shit show. We do make some steps in the right direction by pushing the limits of what strikes can do. I, I also would still say working with unions, working with workers remains so important from a materialist analysis as well. But it's always contradictory to do that in Germany with the big unions. And I suppose we have to fight for the right for political strike first, just as an idea on the side. We'll see. Oh, five minutes. Whew. <clears throat> so the fifth trend is that there's more talk about expropriation or socialization of energy infrastructure to seize the means of production and democratize them. This goes with debates around energy democracy and energy poverty. Every year, more than 300,000 households in Germany, more than 300,000 get cut off, get the energy cut off because they cannot pay their bills in one of the richest countries in the world. So we see again, question of climate and energy being connected with social struggles. I'm skipping something, just so you know, okay. Um, I would like to use the last couple minutes to talk about the false solutions of green capitalism and green colonialism. So we talked about the climate movement, now we talk about the anti-climate movement, the capitalists. The typical response of, neoliberal, of neoliberals to the climate crisis is, don't worry, technology will solve it. So they is often say technologie often nach Lösungen suchen, to be technology open, open for any technology. Of course, this is just a distraction tactic. Not every technology makes sense. And as we will see, this is also a strategy to keep fossil industries running as long as possible. The example I want to talk about today is hydrogen, Wasserstoff. There is this huge hype to, to use hydrogen for everything, even when it doesn't make sense. It can be used for some industries that are hard to electrify, like steel production, but it has a very high cost of production. We call it the champagne of the energy transition. There's only a very limited amount and it's very expensive. But neoliberals and conservatives want to use it for everything for heating houses, for example, where we have much better solutions, solar heat, geothermal heat, heat pumps. But neoliberals, they fight to keep gas heaters running so the poor fossil gas industry can keep going. So they say, hey, some of these gas heaters, they will be able to operate with hydrogen soon. And if we use green hydrogen, that's renewable, right? So. Let's keep, the, let's keep the gas heaters, we have to stay technology open. If voila, gas heaters everywhere instead of the renewable solutions that would make most sense. Same goes for LNG infrastructure. They build LNG terminals, say it's to import green hydrogen later, but now we just import fossil gas and there won't be so much green hydrogen. Yes, so so-called green hydrogen is being produced with renewable energy, but most hydrogen worldwide comes from fossil fo sources or from nuclear energy. Most hydrogen is not green at all. So I like to let people guess. You heard a lot about green hydrogen. What do you think, how much percent in the world, how much percent of hydrogen is green? 20% maybe, 5%. It's less than 0.1%. The champagne of the energy transition. It's absurd. And this is what we cancel the ban on gas heaters for now. <laughs> so to increase the amount of green hydrogen, states of the global north do the same thing they did for the past few centuries, 
just go to the global south and take their resources. So they go to Tunisia, Namibia, though it used to be a German colony, maybe uh, some historical lines we can draw here, to South Africa. They want to build huge solar parks to t and then turn the energy into hydrogen and then import that energy to Europe. Meanwhile, these countries themselves are still very heavily dependent on fossil fuels. It would make so much more sense when you build a solar park there to use the energy there, not convert it. You lose a lot of energy. It's very inefficient. Use the energy there so the coal power plant next door can be turned off. <clears throat> and I haven't even started to talk about the water issue. For all of these countries, water scarcity is becoming a bigger and bigger problem from year to year. Hydrogen is made from water. So the European, pla so the European plans to produce hydrogen in these arid, dry, hot countries also aggravates the water scarcity. So just to paint a picture, okay? Imagine this huge solar park in Namibia, solar panels with a big building to produce hydrogen next door, a big fence around it, military with guns, maybe some drones to keep local people from breaking in and take the water. And there's a big billboard saying, wow, green economy of Europe, advertising the green economy of Europe. That's what we mean when we speak about green colonialism. And this is the green capitalist, you know, capitalist modernity that we are currently seeing too, like that's developing. So I've been talking a lot about hydrogen now, and I do think it's important to learn about these technologies, to call out neoliberal bullshit when you hear it. Um, and we also need to know this stuff because we need to build something better. The democratic modernity we want to build will also need in energy infrastructure. And this infrastructure must be renewable and democratic. Renewables tend to be more democratic anyway, because most of them are more decentral. Fossil fuels need big drilling companies, they need refineries, etc. It's a very centralized industry complexes that are easy to control by a state. If everyone has their own solar panel on their roof, it's a lot harder to cut a whole town off the electricity. This is quite important when we look at war-torn regions, Syria, Rojava, for example. So even on this level, renewables promote resilience and security. But the general sentiment is, of course, technologies alone are not the solutions. We need radical changes in the economic system and in our relation to nature. I think you will be talking more about this now. <laughs> It would be absurd to think that humans are separate from nature. Our struggles, they are not about saving the planet. They are about saving our means of livelihoods, the basis of our lives, creating a system that provides security and justice, sharing all resources and wealth. I'm proud to be in the struggle with you all, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.